Welcome to the Empower Hour with Greater Nashville Mental Health. The Empower Hour will provide information and support about mental health, substance use, and behavioral health. Our goal is to share inspiring stories about transforming lives, to strike down stigma, and to encourage our community to reach out and get help when needed. Mental health is part of all of our lives. It's time we talk about it. I'm Dr. Cynthia Whitaker, President and CEO of Greater Nashville Mental Health, and it's time to get empowered. Hello, and welcome to the Empower Hour with Greater Nashua Mental Health. I'm Dr. Cynthia Whitaker, the President and CEO at Greater Nashua Mental Health, and I have the privilege of hosting this show to help you know more about what's going on in our community as well as at Greater Nashua. So I have the pleasure of having with me today two folks to talk with us about recovery court, also known as drug court, also known as a treatment court. Uh, and so please thank you. Welcome with me, Tim and Randall. Thank you for having us. Oh, you, you are very us. welcome. Thank you for being here. So Tim, do you want to start with just who you are, how long you've been connected to Greater Nashua Mental Health as well as the program? Uh, coming up on my nine year anniversary with uh, Greater Nashua, I came aboard as a, uh, back then, a drug court case manager. Uh, and then I had multiple positions leading up to the being currently the coordinator of the, the treatment court. Nice. So nine years and you are currently charged with coordinating lots of folks that are part of this team. Yeah, it's a multidisciplinary team. So we're dealing with multiple police departments, probation, uh, defense bar, prosecution, um, peer support uh, through our uh, partnership with Revive, case management team, uh, treatment team, uh, jail representatives, things of that nature. So uh, I think my, my former uh, boss uh, who had that position for about seven years it's it's like hard and cat sometimes <laughs> yeah there's a lot of people to put to put together and um, a big part of that is of course the participants that yes. are in the program and so randall you've graduated from the program so why don't you introduce yourself uh, however you want to all right i'm randall uh i joined uh treatment court drug court or recovery court um in july 20th of 2022 I graduated from the program in September, uh, January of this year. Um, yeah, I, I earned my spot in the treatment court by um, not living the proper way and mm. um, getting into a program that has helped me put my life back together. Yeah, well, I appreciate you being here to, to share that story because I really think there's, there's power in people hearing not only the things we would want to say about what it is and what it does, um, but also how it, a true story of how it changes a life. Yeah. Um, so Tim, why don't you start with kind of the basics of what the program entails when somebody comes in, what it looks like, and then we'll pass it to Randall after that to, to say his experience within it. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the, the programs, in a sense, we're kind of um, treatment meets the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. um, it's very specific to the population that uh, it can be successful with, and that's high risk, high need. Uh, so individual really, in, they're in high need of treatment. Uh, they've been generally uh, unsuccessful or haven't engaged in any treatment. Uh, so uh, the disease of addiction is kind of run rampant throughout their life. Um, high risk in a sense of the traditional criminal justice system doesn't meet the criteria in the sense of change. Mm -hmm. uh, they, there's a saying they can do uh, time standing on their head. Mm. Uh, they're frequent to the, the local jails and the prisons, so much so that some identify it as a, like a second home. Mm. Um, so it's very particular to the, the qualifications for individuals coming in. Um, there's a screening process, it's all evidence-based. Uh, probation does a screen uh, for risk to determine uh, what's the chance of recidivism. And if it's high, they meet the need. Uh, and then they have a treatment screen. And once again, if, if they have a substance use disorder uh, and it's currently active, uh, they would meet the high need. 
Um, and as long as you know there's certain exemptions to the program, we don't want to take certain individuals that wouldn't be successful. Um, but that exclusion criteria is minimal, uh, one or two things. Uh, so generally, if you meet criteria, you come into the program. Um, individuals generally are looking from anywhere from two to four, three to six, seven to 15 years in the state prison. Um, so that's kind of the motivator. Yeah. Uh, rarely do people come in and, and think, I'm ready to change my life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, they're, they're faced with the decision of, do I really kind of want to make an attempt at this? Uh, which is honestly the most heroic decision I think yeah. any participant makes when they come into this program with a bunch of strangers telling them how to live their life differently and saying it will be better. Um, but generally kind of that, it, that's the process and it's a be behavioral modification program. So they get two to 300 hours of treatment, uh, a lot of evidence-based, only evidence-based, CBT, DBT, you know, the matrix, uh, a lot of cognitive restructuring and things of that nature, um, but also getting them kind of situated with the recovery community. And that's been a game changer for us over the years mm -hmm. of having individuals engage with peer support. Mm -hmm. um, it, Randall will be able to speak to that um, pretty well mm -hmm. in, yeah. in his experience. But I, I would say I, I call it a few things a game changer. Having a housing program like community, uh, CHIP, Community Housing Program, to allow our individuals to come into our program, have stable, sober housing. Mm -hmm. um, but that peer support and our partnership with Revive uh, has really been truly to have peer support sit on the team. And when the client isn't in that room, when we're talking about plans and what we need to do, how we can engage, to have someone who's kind of live that life and walk those steps to be able to be there for the client when the client's not there to speak for themselves has been crucial for our team to really advance the ball down the field of like, mm. how do we get better outcomes for people? Sounds intensive. <laughs> so you, you, you mentioned treatment, you mentioned peers, you mentioned case management, like to help with recovery, mm -hmm. there's probation, there are all the people you mentioned on the team sounds pretty intensive. Mm -hmm. um, was it what you expected? Was it, yeah, what, uh, what was it for you to experience that? Well, Randall? Tim mentioned uh, at the beginning that there's a choice, mm -hmm. um, either go to prison or try to get your life in order. Um, when I went through all my qualifications, I met them with flying colors. Um, it was like getting, um, I graduated from college and I played pro baseball and I lived a normal life and then I found drugs to the point where I was committing crimes on a, a regular regular occurrence. And um, it starts off with, you know, you fight with the prosecutor to allow you to get into treatment court because the, the prosecutor's first reaction normally is you've done the crime, you gotta do the time. Um, but I was fortunate enough that I had a judge that was part of drug court and she was the one that said that I should try to get into it. Um, while I was trying to get into drug court, I continually com committed crimes. I had gone to, I think it was seven rehabs in a year and a half. Mm. Um, none of those stuck. Um, lasted no more than 30 days when I left those at the most. I was actually thinking about that today. Um, mm. I was trying to think what was my longest time. I, I can't remember being at a house for 30 days. I had tried it in Laconia, Rochester, Manchester, uh, Nashua, you know, throughout New Hampshire. Um, when I came into to, to drug court is what I've originally called it because I, I was there to, to try to lose my drug charges um, and other nice things I'd done. Um, it was tough. Uh, you initially get into a program where you're you're not really part of society. Mm -hmm. um, the society you're living into and become accustomed to is what people think it's a sketchy way of life, but that became my normal. Um, when I came into to drug court, it was, in, like I was saying, in July. Um, I remember the first day I pled into, uh, pled into it. I was sitting in front of Judge uh, Colburn, and she came off the bench and shook my hand and said, welcome to drug court. And uh, I was like, wow, this is an interesting start. Mm -hmm. And uh, then they initially brought me downstairs and sat me at a table with Tim. and. Um, we went over my treatment plan because unfortunately for me, I had gotten in trouble the day before I got into drug court. So I came from, uh, you know, one of those nice vans that they bring you around in. <laughs> and um, 
we sat down and we went over my plan. And then uh, Nellie, who is a probation officer, she brought me to lunch and then we went to her office. And there was just a sense of like, there's a chance here. Mm. Um, I've been clean for over two years now, but when I came in to this program, the only thing I was worried about was not committing crimes. Mm. Um, what Tim mentioned was is that at first you started an IOP program at Greater Nashua, which with a bunch of other people, and uh, you do nine hours a week, I believe it was. Mm -hmm. And then you have your case manager once a week, um, which ended up being Tim after a little while. Um, and then therapy once a week, um, Dr. Connors, which is your psychiatr psychi psychiatric helper. Um, and they set me up with sober living, which I can currently still live in. Um, Whereas I said, mentioned before, I couldn't stay for 30 days. I've been at one now for over 24 months. Um, and when I came into this program, the, the gifts of this program are is that if you do what they show you to do and you listen instead of surrendering into what you were before, you, your life can change. Um, it allows you to work through your real, your trauma, even if it's not ingrained trauma, you've created trauma um, with the legal system. Whereas now, when I see like Nellie, I consider her not a friend because she still could put me in prison if I was, she wanted to, <laughs> but I consider her somebody that I respect mm. the utmost because she was very difficult on me. Tim was difficult. Everybody was difficult on me when I first got into the program because, you know, I still had, I was one of the few people that didn't clear all my stuff before I got into the program, which was unique at that moment. Um, but it's allowed me to get my life back. I've got my parents back in my life, my daughter in my life. I can show up, I'm present. And I got the opportunity now to, to help other people going through drug court where I'll go to meetings with them. I'll mm. pick them up when they're struggling. Um, I'll talk to them about working through the program and how like, cause Tim sits on the other side of the table. That's cause we sit at a table when we do it. Well, you, re you realize that that table isn't against you. There, there's a reason we're at the table because we're at like a, a family dinner mm -hmm. and we're just talking as a family to try to get you to get your family back. And, you know, just saying that gives me chills because it's given me my life back. Mm -hmm. And um, there's no better place to, for somebody like that myself that just kept going to rehab. The court system would say, you need to do this, but we need more intensive care. And that's what Greater Nashville does f for people like myself. Yeah, there's there's so much to unpack there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what both of you shared, um, and I, I like the the question I want to ask is like the difference, right? You mentioned the multiple rehabs, the multiple um, tries before, and it not working, but this working, and I, I think the answer is a little bit about what you both mentioned, like you mentioned, it's a specific program for high risk, high need. Yeah. So there's certain people we know this program works for. And then you just mentioned intensity, mm -hmm. like that there, it's an intensive program. And so is yeah. it those kind of things together that make it different? I think it is. I think, you know, they originally they called it accountability court. Mm. And I think that's a, a key. Uh, and sometimes when you're going through it, you don't, you don't appreciate it probably <laughs> as a participant. I've had lots of conversations. But we're planning for you to be out of drug court and then complete it on day one in that sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so people call it boot camp. Uh, but ultimately, you know, the questions I ask are like, what do you want to do? How can we get you there? Mm -hmm. And Randall had some clear pathways of, of goals that he'd like to accomplish. And then it was at times, and he can probably attest to it, we'd be like, slow down, yeah. not yet. Uh, yeah. Knowing that he's going to do these goals and we want him to just do it in timing uh, to be as successful as possible. Mm. Um, and lo we're thinking long-term, mm. right? Mm. Um, not just to get through the program and good job, you did everything we we'd <laughs> said and la planned out for you. Now go ahead, you're gonna be successful. Usually that does not occur. Yeah. We mm. usually see the individuals coming back into the program um, or back into the system. So it's really finding what Randall wanted. And, and in this case, Randall really wanted his family, mm -hmm. <laughs> really wanted his daughter, right? Uh, initially really wanted to like get a job. And we were like, 
it's not the time. Mm -hmm. It's treatment time, mm -hmm. right? And so when he got the job, we were less concerned that he would not be successful at it. Because he, he waited he, till he there put was that foundation yeah, in place. Nice. Mm -hmm. um, and honestly, uh, you know, treatment program, treatment is the most crucial part of it, right? Mm -hmm. And so the relationships that he built in his groups with his individual therapists, they were really so crucial to formulating a lot of that cognitive restructuring to ensure that one, he knew he could do it, but then the confidence and the steps on kind of how to get there. Yeah, yeah. So. You, you shake in agreement like, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what resonated with you in well, that? Well, like you said, he told me I had to slow down. My whole life I've always been, I set a goal, I'm gonna reach that goal, but it's the first time in my life where I, they didn't let me work for about six months in the mm. program. They had me go over to Revive, as he mentioned, for, for 20 hours of structure time a week. Um, and just take a step back and realize they're, they used to say, you know how to make money, you know how to make a living, but you don't know how to live clean. Mm. And because of the fact that they've made me slow down so much, I still practice those steps, even though I'm not part of the program. As Tim likes to say, uh, drug court is um, aftercare. That's the fifth pay phase of it is for the rest of your life. And um, I just it just forces me to slow down and, and to not just think of what I want in the situation, but what do I need in the situation? Mm. Do I want a new house? Yeah, do I need a new house? Do I want my own apartment? Do I need the new apartment? Do I want to do this? Do I need a new car? Do I want to drive? Mm. It's like finding the equal balance of what, what do I need and not just what I want. And mm. by going to those classes and sitting with the probation officer and going over your, basically rebooting a computer, um, you know, I'd never had any record before I was 40 years old. And, um, but boy, did I add to it quick, <laughs> you know, there's, I'll put my record in a couple years up against anybody that's been in the program. And um, the way my brain thinks now and the way I think in general is like, by slowing down so much that I don't go anywhere without a plan. I don't go into a store without a, without a mission. I don't go look, I don't window shop anymore at anything. I go, wherever I'm doing anything, I take a step back and look at what do I need to do to get there. And, you know, sitting in IOP classes, which is the intensive outpatient that we do at Greater Nashua, to sit with other people that are going through similar situations, no one's situation is the same, no one's family situation is the same, no one's educational system is the same, no one's trauma is the same, but we all have the same idea. Mm -hmm. And at first it's what's not go to prison. Right. And right. then eventually, the, eventually it becomes, how can we live our best life? Mm -hmm. And um, to be able to see the people when they walk through the door, some people, like I finished in 18 months, there's people that take six years, but when they walk out after six years, they're, they're in the same place I was at 18 months. They're, they just, I surrendered. It was mm -hmm. the first time in my life I ever said, I surrender. Like, like I played for coaches my whole life and, and coaches, they allow you onto the field, but Greater Nashville allowed me to how to build my foundation Instead mm. of out of sand, so when the water comes, it rushes away. It's built out of, of stone. Mm. So now that when a situation arises, I look at both sides of the fence and, and realize, all right, Buzzy, you're just doing what you want, not what you need. <laughs> There's I, so much in what you just said, mm. Randall. One, I think they're so, so important for people to understand that people come to treatment court, recovery court, in many different paths. So yeah, yeah. yours was one of, you know, being a professional athlete, not having any criminal background until the age of 40, boom, right? Yeah. Like, wow, yeah. right? And others maybe have different histories that bring them there at a much younger age, yeah. or you see a lot of maybe growth in, they were doing a little things, little things, and then those things built up. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't. It doesn't matter, yeah. and I think that's, important for people to understand yeah. that there is no one. All paths in and all paths out. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. There's many paths to success and there's many paths to recovery, mm -hmm. but there's also many paths to getting to the challenge and it could mm -hmm. be any one of us at any time. Yeah, all it takes is, is like for me, I, I always had an addictive personality and I tried numerous drugs, but I was always able to put them down until I found the drug that I loved mm -hmm. and it gave me 
for me, I've come to the conclusion that I was always a little depressed and that I was always looking for something. And that's through just in the two years that I was in drug court, over a hundred hours of therapy of sitting there and trying to figure out why I got here. And then eventually the therapist taught me that it wasn't about why you got here, but it's about what you're going to do not to come back here. Exactly. And, 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 and for me, I've tried to come off antidepressants, which something that I always, you know, I've, I'm a little older, so they were, they were taboo a little bit in a lot of ways. It was a weakness. And I've tried to come off them, and, and I can feel myself now by taking that step back and feel where my mind is going, not so much that I want to use, but to isolate and to go back into a little bit of a hole is where I'll, then I'll go right back to it and I'll get. But if I had just rushed and I got the job and I got all this other stuff and I just worked on looking like a good life from the outside instead of looking like I have a good life from the inside, mm -hmm. there's a big difference. And I think, I think that's the difference between what you guys offer in your program and what a 30 or 90 day program offers. You're helping us, and when you go to a 30, 90 day program, it's all right, for 30 days you're getting off the drugs. Great, now go back to the world. And the person, all they know how to do is not near the drugs. They haven't worked on their mental health, which is the main reason everybody's there. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and even 60 days, so you got 30 days of feelings again, and then you're like, wow, this feels good. And then after 90 days, the pink cloud, as we like to call it in the, in the, the field, is that, wow, I've caused a lot of harm, and this harm's still there. And you know what, I've worked really hard to get my life together, but you know what, no one else thinks 90 days is much work. You know, like yeah. my dad's one of my best friends and he, I, I see him three days a week for lunch, but it took him six months of me proving to him that I actually was gonna change. Cause you know, as an addict, I can, there's one thing I can do, I can manipulate you. Yeah. You know. Well, I, <laughs> really Randall, like so much. Not us. No, 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 no. <laughs> Drug court didn't listen to me, unfortunately. They didn't so me. much in what you just said, like, because I think, I mean, what just hit me, I'll just share mine. What just hit me that is really, I think, different because we're with you for the long haul. Yeah. You're so right. Like in that beginning stage, the only thing you, you can focus on is getting your own head unfoggy, yeah. clear. But often in that clarity comes guilt and shame. To say the least. Right? Yeah. And if you don't have the people that are still with you, yeah in a program that's intensive to help you manage the guilt and the shame, it's easy to go right back yeah. to where you were before to try to avoid those feelings. That's what we know. Right. I mean, in many ways, I think this program forces you to do work that many people in the world mm -hmm. struggle to do. I mean, you it's, literally have to look at yourself and yeah. the things There's you've no done. There's no suffering in silence. Yeah. Because we will call it out. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And I think the, the psychiatry services and obviously the therapeutic services along the way, there's a lot of distractions, whether it's getting the job that you want right now, whether it's I want a certain medication. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. <laughs> and it's having that group of individuals, your team around you to call it out, then to let treatment go through it. Mm -hmm. I couldn't tell you what he did really for treatment. I can tell you the modalities, but the work and the really hard work that he did within those walls, it's you know only privy to him, but he did the work and the heavy lifting yeah. to do that. We were just able to kind of be present to allow that to happen. So mm -hmm. I think that's crucial because everyday life, if people just trudge on, mm -hmm. go to work, yeah. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Suffer in silence. A uh, difference is when this population suffers in silence, they die. Yeah. Yep. They end Gosh. up yeah. they end yeah. up incarcerated. They ended up treated like throwaway citizens, right? Mm -hmm. They don't have the support at work that, mm -hmm. you know, maybe the average individual has. They burnt every bridge. So mm -hmm. they, Right, know, they need they need the support network around. Yeah. Uh, like uh, you need it around you it's, to yeah. say, yeah. Yeah, that's right. That did happen and you can still lead, lead a clean, sober, yeah. good life. We're going to get through this. Yeah, I remember for about six to the, six months to nine months, when I finally turned the corner, I can remember sitting there with my therapist every week saying, "I can't die now. Mm. Like I can't die now because I'm on I'm on the rise again. I, my story can't end here. 
my story. Like it, it you know, it, it gives me goosebumps because it brings me back to where I was. And, and, and now I, like I have conversations with a lot of people because I'm really active in the community from, from this program, because if it wasn't for this program, I would never go to meetings. I wouldn't go to Revive where I consider it a second home. But I talk to people about that three to nine month window of like your emotions. Yeah. And, and if after three, after 90 days, if they had just thrown me away, I would have never had somebody holding my hand to the fire being like, here, you need to go to treatment today. Oh, here, you need to go to therapy today. All right, here, you need to go see your case manager today. Here, you need to go see your recovery coach today. Here, you gotta go see your probation officer. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, that's a list. It you is. Know, you know what it I mean? Is. That's that's a list, you know? And and the thing is, is the list works. Yeah, I was gonna say it m might help more of us if we had a longer list than yeah. we have, yeah. um, right? Yeah. right? We like to call that your support team, yeah. right? You Imagine know? if we all had a support team in our life. Yeah. Yeah and then a judge to reinforce it, yeah. right? Yeah. We'd all deal with our mental health issues. Yeah. <laughs> like we'd all deal yeah. with our, you yeah. know. Yeah. And so uh, yeah. it, it is super intense. And that's why I think, again, it's you know, go back and I can't say it enough about how heroic to make that choice, but then to stick with it, right? Yeah. To be able to say, this is uncomfortable. This is painful. It hurts. I, I don't know what it is. I don't know if this is all for naught. Um, we just had a conversation about yeah. a, a client that's doing you know, really well, but is not sure this, this life is for her. Because yeah. mm. she, she's never experienced it. Mm -hmm. But instead of being impulsive, and she has great support through the recovery community, through mm. Randall, she's able to say, I'm just going to keep working my program and to figure it out. Mm. And I know that, like for me as a, a participant in the program, I know that's exactly where she's supposed to be at after eight months because that's where I was. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But what she's doing compared to some of the other participants in the program is, is that their program is greater natural mental health. And eventually that program's going to leave them. But if they don't use the resources, which you guys partner with Revive, yeah. that those are the real resources. Like the this long term. Is, yeah, like... The foundation is laid at Greater Nashua, but like the life is laid out at Revive. Mm. They revive your life. If the name is fitting, you know what I mean? You, you, you come from the ashes, you know what I mean? And like. We can use a sports analogy, right, Randall, right? <laughs> like it's, are you playing the inning or are you playing the whole game? Yeah. Right, like yeah. you're playing the long game. Yeah. Right, and yeah, I think treatment core, this intensity is there for a chapter of that, an inning of that. Yeah. Right. But it, it's to set you up to be successful in the long game. But it's a long inning. But, yeah. but it's a long inning. <laughs> <laughs> you threw a lot of pitches. <laughs> yeah. You walked the bases loaded too many times. Yeah, yeah too many times. Yeah. Okay. But, but, right, like, but that's, I think that's the key. It yeah. sounds like that they're just really that, that foundation mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. But with with people watching outside of this room, like people that keep committing crimes, they're like, they need to be in prison. You know what? If I never went to if I went to prison and wasn't sitting here, I would just be a guy sharpening my craft in the criminality of the world. Yeah. I would have come out where I would have just been worse because you're around a bunch, you know, as they call it, called con college. You know what I mean? Where you're you're hearing other people's approaches, you're meeting the wrong people, and you're not getting the help you need. And I believe anybody that is willing to put their foot down, look in the mirror, take accountability for their life, which is the number one thing, is accountability, because without that word, you're, 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 you have no paddles uh, to get through life, that you can make the change. You know, your, your peak, everybody's like what we were saying earlier, everybody's peak and everybody's valleys are different. And what, for everybody to get to where their pinnacle of their life should be is totally different than where mine is, where Tim's is, where yours mm -hmm. is. Exactly. We're all different people. And, and, and you have to realize is that some people, that when you walk down the street and you see that person that's struggling, that was me two and a half years ago. Now I'm sitting here with a car, a life, a job, my family, don't bother anybody. And, and that's because of greater national mental health. Mm -hmm. That's because of the the criminal justice system that's and in many ways i might even say healthier than many people who never committed crimes in their yeah. lives yeah. because you have committed to being prepared to having plans to holding yourself accountable yeah. um 
I think of it as a, the term recovery of capital, and we were talking mm. about this mm. before we came on, is he no longer uh, invests in his wants, he invests in himself, yeah. right? And yeah. so when we talk what his life looks like now, it's really an investing on the inside, as you yeah. mentioned earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and it plays out on the outside because now he affects so many people in a positive way mm. versus, yeah. you know, two and a half years ago yeah. for umpteen amount of years, yeah, yeah. you know, they would say, you know, lock him up. Yeah. He's, a, he's a danger. He's impacting yeah. making people's lives worse. <laughs> and if he had done that, wrong. he'd still be doing <laughs> yeah. that. Right. Uh, right. You know, the statistics are great uh, around incarceration has never made anyone anyone yeah. better. It does make a community safer for a small portion of the community that are really unsafe, uh, that can't be in the community, but for individuals fighting uh, the disease of addiction, I'm not sure if you don't treat it co-occurringly that you're going to change the outcomes no matter how many times you lock them up. Well, it's not the long game. Because they come back out. No. Right, it's not the long game. No. It's the short out, term. Yeah. To no housing, they'll come out right, to come no out employment. Right, come out to no housing, no employment. To no support network. To potentially yeah. more and, debt. And you'll say, yeah. you'll be okay. Yeah, hold on, yeah. hold on. Yeah. Go fly. <laughs> you have yeah. no family, you have no uh, justice on your side. You have to check in with these people. You, you have all these yeah. other responsibilities, but you have no chance. Well, and, and I also think, Tim, it goes back to what you were saying about then the suffering is in secret, mm -hmm. right? Because if you're on probation after you leave incarceration, do you share your struggles? Mm -hmm. Do you share your temptations to mm -hmm. use even if you're not using? Maybe not, right? Because you feel like that, that yeah. power struggle, that evaluation, right. that yeah. constant, right? Even if it even if the professionals feel like it's safe, it probably doesn't feel safe. Yeah. Well, it's adversarial, the whole, the whole the system. The whole system, right? exactly. And so many people coming out, you know, best laid plans, but they come out and they report to probation, parole. Mm -hmm. there's, there's no therapist involved, right. right? There's no referral to treatment, right? You'll get the basics, there's where the shelter is, there's where the soup kitchen is. Right. And mm -hmm. nowadays they, they participate in the community housing program, so they get you a sober bed, but it ends there, and they expect you to just, just do the, the next right thing. Yeah. And when you don't have the skill set or the tools or you haven't learned, your brain hasn't healed, you're asking someone to do the yeah. impossible. Yeah. yeah, and maybe somebody that's lower risk, lower need, it's successful, yeah. right? Yeah. right? And I, I think that's why it's important that, again, the program focuses on high risk, high yeah. need, because folks with lower risk, lower need, maybe are successful in a more traditional mm -hmm. program yeah. because they might have the support system or have the skills. Those are the, the individuals skills. we'd like to divert out of the system, right? Yeah. Right, it, completely, right. right. Yeah. And not over, over treatment them and things of that nature. Yeah, right, um, exactly. So it's, yeah, it's a very specific population to the high risk I need, um, but also the greatest impact, you know, on recidivism. Yeah, yeah, yeah we, we were talking about um, recently uh, you are calculating the graduation rate for the program. So uh, it's 65%, uh, which is basically, uh, it's probably around or above the, the standard uh, around that. Um, so we keep data. Data drives the stakeholders. Data drives everything in our program, how we do treatments, how we inter interact with the participants. Um, and so we collect a lot of data. Um, and. 65 is good, but we're always looking for 66, mm -hmm. 67. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. uh, and we have a graduation coming up this Friday. We have nine more graduates. We had 15 during, mm -hmm. during Randall's, which will be our biggest year of uh, graduates. But so I'm doing a lot of um, exit surveys, social functioning surveys, who wasn't employed or housed when they came in, who was housed, and you just see <laughs> the difference. Yeah. But the satisfaction survey uh, kind of goes back to suffering and silence is how helpful for each role the team has been. And they, they always want to answer extremely helpful, extremely helpful. Mm -hmm. And then you got to stop and say, we need you to be honest and critique us or we won't get better. And so, you know, the, the last two questions is what's the best part of the program for you? What would be one thing you could change? And a lot of them are hesitant. Mm. to still tell us, mm. and I said, well, just think if a loved one would be coming into this program. What would you want for them? What would you want yeah. for them? To be able to get a real truthful answer, even if it's painful, Yeah. Uh, to be able to then bring that back to the team and say, 
these are what people saying. What can we do? How yeah. can we do it better? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I remember early on, right? I was mm. part part of the team that was helping to set up um, drug court in its initial beginnings. You know, one of our negative feedback was from people that. Um, English wasn't their first language. Mm -hmm. And so we needed to translate some of the materials. Like we needed that feedback mm -hmm. uh, early on to make sure we weren't creating wow. inequity in success rates because of something we were doing. Mm -hmm. Reducing barriers. Right, reducing <laughs> barriers to being success, part of them. exactly. Um, so Randall, uh, like. When I hear Tim say like, yeah. what, what can you do better? Like it's, it is a tough question for the ones that really work the program because if, if they're sitting there and they're like, damn, I got my life back, I got my family back, I have a job, I'm self-sufficient, I'm living, I'm not worried about seeing anybody come near me, and uh, what else can you ask for? Mm. You know what I mean? It's a, it's, a, it's a valid question and, you know, it's like when I sit here and like the people that are new, if they ever watch this, they're going to be like, wow, he's kissing butt, but it's not, it's the truth. Yeah. You know what I mean? I came in a broken man. I was living in the shelter because no sober living wanted me. Uh, they f I had to go, like, I wasn't allowed to ask my family for anything. They couldn't give me food. I, they made me have to use every self-sufficient resource that I could do. And guess what? I sit here a different person. Hmm. Do I, am I better than any of them? Hell no, because you know what? They have a chance to be sitting here in two years yeah. if they're willing to do the work. But if they're not willing to do the work, the only person they have, which the, the program teaches you, is your own self accountability. Is like if you, you only get what you put in. Like as you move along through the program, you go from uh, therapy once a week to like once every two weeks. Once your choice, but you also have the choice to go every single week. Mm -hmm. And I did it through the whole time, and I continually do it to this time because it's what changed my life. It's an hour a week where I get to talk to somebody about me, mm -hmm. and when I leave, I don't have to talk about it again. But you know what, I still have to process it. Yeah. And I still have to sit there and think about it. And I still have to realize, why do I feel this way? And, it's, and it goes back to the want and the needs. Why do I feel this way? Because I want something I don't need. Hmm. I want something quicker than I deserve it. I want something faster than I earned it. And it, it, you know, it, it go, all goes back to the IOP classes, you know, where you're sitting there and you just, you're like, man, I hate this. Because it's like being in rehab again. And, and no one likes rehab. Everybody, 99% of people go to rehab to fill somebody else's need for them. Mm. Whereas this time we're filling our own need so we don't have to go to jail. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Like I've never done a jail sentence. Have I seen a jail before? Yeah, unfortunately. But you know what? If, if I'd done one more thing, I wouldn't be sitting here. I'd be sitting up in Concord, mm. sitting there in a cell, thinking life's good because they let me go outside to play basketball today. Whereas today I got to hike a mountain. I'm gonna leave here, go to yoga class. Um, you know what I mean? I, I, live, I live my life now. And you know what, probably after that I'll hit a meeting. And not because I need it, because I want it. And I don't always wanna to go to a meeting, but I'm scared which one to miss. Because in, in classes you learn to take out what other people are going through so that when you get to that problem, you know how to solve it. And, and, and like Tim was mentioning earlier, people that don't wanna open up, it, it's just the only program in the world where if you sit in class and you say your life is good and life's grand, that when you sit in front of the judge, you get in trouble. <laughs> because no, your life isn't good. Your life isn't grand and things aren't good. And if you don't open up about the fact that you want to use drugs and you want to get high and you don't like your life and you're miserable, you're, you're, you're gonna, not going right. to fail. You're not going to keep moving on. It's the only place yeah, where you're going to talk about it continuously. Yeah, you're going to say, no, you're not happy. You're not happy. If you're you like, were really happy <laughs> having a great life, would you be here in this program yeah, right now? Yeah. Probably not. And people try to like, you know, like Tim said, I can't manipulate them. But you can manipulate people that don't understand the brain. Yeah. But, you know, Tim's been here for, he said, nine years. You know what I mean? He's, he's dealt with a million other Randalls. You know what I mean? They might not have been the same, but they're, we're all the same. At the begin, at the and it's a mental health issue. Yeah. It's not a drug problem, it's a mental health issue. And right, and it's relearning how to think. It's re yeah. relearning how to sit with yourself. Yeah. It's taking Allow the brain to yourself. heal. Yeah. Allowing the brain to heal, yeah. 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 Right. It's Absolutely. like you got a computer 
and the thing gets spammed on it, is, and you're like, oh, I just want you to clean it out. No, 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 you need a new hard drive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? You need a new hard drive. You gotta reinstall Microsoft Outlook to get your life back. <laughs> you, you can't use the one that's corrupted, and that's pretty much what right. we're well, doing. And you wouldn't do it to yourself, right? You'd bring it to the experts. Yeah. But, right, you know, but right. We, you'd bring it to the experts <laughs> to help you yeah. clean it out, that's and right. And unfortunately, we don't want to admit they're the experts. Right. Yeah. But at the end of the day, Tim could be somewhere else making a lot more money. If he didn't care about what he was doing and changing lives and seeing the rewards, they, they wouldn't be here. You know, there's people that come and they go and they don't stay. It's because it doesn't meet what they want. But the people that are part of that table, there's 10 of us that sit on the table every day when you go to court, once a week, once a week for three months, what is it? Yeah. And then once Minimum. every and then, then once every two weeks and once every three weeks and once a month and then is it every three months at the end? Yeah. Yeah, quarterly. Yeah. Whereas you hate going, by the end you can't wait to, to go. go. Because you know what, I get to sit in front of them and tell them, you know what, I still haven't failed the test. You know what, you remember when you told me I was gonna do this? Well, guess what, I haven't done that. Wow. And they, you know, and you just get to sit there. Like yeah. I'll be at graduation on Friday and get to see people that I remember when they came in after me that were sick. You know what I mean? We're still sick, every human being's sick. But you know what? They've gotten the cancer treatment they needed, the cancer in their life. Yeah. Is there a chance that they can go back? Yeah. But you know what? There's also a chance they never will. That's right. And, and the great part of Recovery Court is, is that when you screw up in this program, they, they, they give you the resources to get well. And I've had people that I've graduated with, what is it, seven months now? Yeah. Eight or mine, that I've seen back in recovery and, and um, rehab again, but you know what, they went on their own. They didn't go back out, they didn't go out and commit crimes, they knew what they needed to do to get back to where they were, because that their new normal was way better than the using normal. Mm. It's so much gold in all of this conversation. And like, you mentioned the peer recovery support being part of the program being a game changer, and I think that's obvious from just hearing Randall's story. You and I could sit here and talk <laughs> about success rates and what the program right. entails, but to hear your story yeah. about being a broken person with a changed life, mm -hmm. there, there's, there's no statistic or data that, that speaks that and wow. compares to that. So I, I very much appreciate you sharing yeah. Your story publicly, mm -hmm. you know, with me, with the mm -hmm. folks that are going to watch this, mm -hmm. and is there is there anything else that we haven't touched on that you want people to know about recovery in general, or the program, or anything? If you have a family member, or you have somebody in your family that's struggling, you know, there's Revive in Derry, there's Revive in Manchester, and there's Revive in Nashua. They might not give you the answer you want, but they're going to give you the answer you need. Yeah. And, and, you know, I keep saying wants and needs, but, you know, that place, when I didn't have a phone from growing up with everything, you know, at my own house, my own apartment buildings, and my own stuff, I had no phone when I came in here. They gave me a phone. You know what? They taught me, by going to that place, they taught me to go to meetings. Mm -hmm. Like this program, like I was saying, the foundation is given, but the real, the real gift of this program is in the meetings. Yeah. And it's it, there's there's millions of ways to go to meetings. Like for me, I like yoga, I like church, I like NA, I like AA, I like Dharma. Mm -hmm. I like anything that makes me have to stop and think. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the crucial part is the exposure, right? Yeah. Because you know part of our structure is that we involve peer support from the beginning, but throughout the program, you know, there's phases and people petition is. We want people to go out and try things, even if they don't like it. So let's talk about what you didn't like about it. Mm -hmm. And if we weren't able to do that, Randall wouldn't understand why. Wow, I like a lot of stuff out there. Yeah. Right? And he continues to do that a lot of stuff. So I think that's like another crucial component mm. of uh, we don't force meetings, but we force people to try new things. And the ones that make it, and the ones that, I don't say make it, but they, they stay clean because you can go backwards. You can have a hiccup. You can have a lapse. That that doesn't make you a failure. That's right. But the the ones that are least likely to have those lapses are the ones that are going to meetings. They're going to therapy. They're because this program ends 
and, and we and close at five and on weekends. Yeah. <laughs> where, our where's your doesn't... support at, right? Yeah, your right. It's out does... there. Yeah, right, because your, addic- right, your addiction <laughs> is not closed no, on weekends. I wish yeah. it was, you know. I was hoping you were closed. <laughs> Hunt it right out. <laughs> Clocked out. That's when I came over. <laughs> well, and the other thing I heard in that, Randall, was hope. Yeah. That regardless of where a person is, yeah. there's hope. Yeah. Right. There are programs that work for people of lower risk, lower mm-hmm. need. There are programs that work for people with higher risk, higher yeah. need. Sometimes it just takes the person being willing or a circumstance yeah. where there's something in it for them, like not going to jail yeah. and to now, get started. And now, like I was when I was on my way back from hiking today, I was I was telling the person, I don't even remember that person. I remember doing those actions, but I can't even comprehend how my mind frame got to there because I've re- I put a new hardware in my system. Like it does, like I know I did it because all I have to do is look at the paper <laughs> or Google myself, which <laughs> I don't suggest that. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> the, the bottom line is it works. It right. works. It does work. Treatment right. works. It does. If you work it, it works. Right. Right. It doesn't. It doesn't work because we have secret uh, sir no. things. It works because. You work on yourself. And Greater Nashville is the best in the aspect of that. It has it all right there. Yeah. There, it's a, it's an a la carte. Yeah. Wraparound services. Yeah. Wraparound services, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Well, uh, again, I appreciate you both. I, I'm excited to to hear about more graduates that we have joining the, the list of 130-ish yes. now graduates from the program. And I thank you both again for being here today with me. Thanks for okay. having us. Thanks for having us. And thank you for watching the Empower Hour with Greater Nashville Mental Health. Hope you have an empowered day. <laughs>